Dead Addict. Welcome to Hangover Sunday. <laughs> Hangover Sunday has been a tradition at DEF CON for 12 years now. How many people here do not drink? A, a, a raise of hands? Okay, you, you, you all feel a lot less pain than, than everyone around you, so, so you win. There are advantages. Today I'm going to talk about hacking the media. And uh, I, I actually had a media person walk up to me and uh, a little bit of concern, and they're like, you know, you're not, you're not going to talk about uh, data poisoning our, our networks and inserting news articles and da 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 I'm like, wow, what a great idea. That'll be my next year's speech. Rock on. No, no, when I'm talking about hacking the media, I'm talking about manipulating the media. And uh, it's all legal. So I, if anyone thinks they're going to learn how to break the law here, I, I, I apologize. And the, the gentleman with Google, uh, the Google speech he spoke yesterday, I'll tell you the quick story behind that. Um, he had a flight out today, and he contacted me and said, hey, I need to switch with someone because I have a flight out. And I'm like, dude, like that, you're going to mess with some speaker, you know? Like, it'll mess up someone's slot. And I'm, I don't want to do that to any other speaker. That's unreasonable. So I'm like, huh, okay, all right. I, I want him to speak, so I'll screw up me. So I, I switched slots with him. Do any of you do volunteer work here? Uh, yeah, some of you, some volunteer work, right on. That's good. Any, any of you uh, uh, ever have any inclinations to like go into a GM factory and to do some volunteer work on, on the floor and to help build some cars just for a couple hours because you know cars do need to be built and they have a business to run so maybe you want to step into the GM plant for a couple hours and, and kind of help out a little bit. Anyone feel those inclinations ever? <laughs> Strange, no hands. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of shocked here. But for some reason, when a reporter walks up to you and says, hey, will you help me do my job and give me content that, that will be paid for, that I'm, my company will make money from, you're, you're kind of doing volunteer work for a multi-billion dollar corporation. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I'll help you out. And then that always feels that way, right? You're, you're always helping the media, I'll help you out. Damn, I, I never helped Jim out. You know, I'm never like, you know what, you guys need cars, I need to help you, you know, we need to make this happen. For some reason, though, there's some magic when a media person walks up to you. And you, you people, I think, feel an obligation or feel compelled to talk to them. You shouldn't feel that. You have no obligation to these people. Nothing. You owe them nothing. It's, it, it's unreasonable to give away content for no reason. Furthermore, there's bad reasons to give away your content. If you're like, you know what? Damn, I'm going to be on TV. That'll be cool. My friends will see me. They'll be like, holy cow, I'm on TV. That's nifty. So then your, re your reason is ego. Now, I have an ego. You all have egos. I understand this. But if that's your only reason for deciding to agree to be interviewed by either print or video uh, media, I, I propose that that's a very bad reason. And if you want to still have your ego stroke, you can have that. Because the fact they walked up to you, want to talk to you, and are interested in you, bingo. All that ego gratification could and should be satisfied right there. And then, if you want to, you can say, no, thank you. I really don't want to talk to you. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about when you should say that and when you shouldn't say that. When is it a good time to actually engage the media? When do you want to gain their attention? When do you want to spend your time, your energies, giving something to them? So if, if you don't have your own personal agenda, your own personal agenda, I propose don't talk to the media. If you don't have a, 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 a reason and a message that you want to communicate, and there's a few reasons for this. A few reasons why you might want to talk to the media. I talked to uh, someone who's, who's somewhat well known here a few years ago, uh, Peter Shipley. And I said, and I like Peter. I've known, I've known Peter for years. Some people don't like him. I like him. I said, Peter, why are you such a goddamn media whore? Because you can only really say things like that to your friends, right? He's like, well, I'll tell you, dead addict. 
I figured out that every time I stepped in front of a camera and talked to the media, I ended up making about $10,000 more a year. I'm like, holy shit, that's a good answer. Oh my god, that's, that's so reasonable. I'm done with that program. So, you know, and, and you, people have been labeled as media whores, and sometimes I'm a media whore. I'll just flat out say it. Um, but that, that, that's a very good reason. He's essentially um, intentionally furthering his own career and making his name out there so he can do his consulting work or whatever his business is. His, his bosses see him on there and like, oh, you are important. Maybe we're not paying you enough. Maybe someone will try to steal you from us. So here's more money. I believed him when he told me this, but it actually happened to me too. I, uh, and I'll, I'll uh, explain the anecdote and the interaction with a piece of media a little bit later. But I appeared on uh, a national television program for a while, and man, they, they, in some respects, I was really unhappy with the context I was portrayed. But um, about a week after that, uh, I was contacted and given a consulting gig outside of work that made me uh, the kind of money that, that Mr. Shipley is talking about. Um, I, it was really well, and, and that happened because someone knew who I was, but seeing my face on television reminded them, holy cow, that addict needs some money, and we want to give it to him. That was great. One thing that's very important, I, I want to talk to you, how do you choose which media to talk to? And to some extent, I, I blame the person that's bitten by the media, who gets news bitten, who gets a sound bite. I, I blame that on the person. If, if they're burned, generally, I, I think it's the responsibility of the person that's burned. That doesn't mean that the, the media that burns you is, is good or, or competent or all this, any of this sort of thing. But you need to do research. You don't go into a job and you don't work for a company without knowing anything about them. Um, you research a company. And the same way, you need to do the same kind of due diligence on a reporter that a good reporter should be doing on you and your stories. Uh, a reporter walks up to you and says, hey, I want to talk to you. And you're like, great, give me a Google. I need a, I need a net connection. Like, give me 10 minutes with net connection. You want to look at two things. First, the output of the reporter in the past. I, I, I found in life that it's reasonable to judge people's future behaviors on their past behaviors. It's a reasonable thing for all human beings, I think. If, if someone's behaved in a certain way throughout life, they're going to behave that way in the future. So if a reporter's been writing bad hatchet jobs for 10 years, and they, can, they give you your, their name, and you say, okay, I'm going to talk to you, without researching them. Well, if you research them, you'll figure out that they're going to destroy you, right? And you can prevent this. And if a reporter isn't comfortable with you doing this, like, a little peripheral research on them before, they, before you talk to them, that's probably not a good sign. And, and yeah, it's, that, that's not good. So there, there's a couple of things. Print media versus video journalism. Oh, I, I'm sorry, some air quotes there. Video journalism, the television press. You can't tell a story in three minutes. You can add facts to something, a body of knowledge that people are already familiar with in three minutes, that's not a problem. But uh, for, for this audience, uh, the hacker and security community, everyone is ignorant. The general public doesn't know anything. So if you want to attempt to inform them, it'll take the context of something larger. And there, there is some video media that, that, that has a larger context to work it within. But CNN, no, you're, you're not going to, um, you're not going to give them enough information to, three minutes isn't enough to inform anyone about anything, really. Noam Chomsky, Anyone know that name? Chomsky? Hands? A few? Okay. He won, he, he's uh, on the media all over the world, and he's not on the, on the media here so much in America, and he is kind of a dissident against American politics. But one, one thing he says is um, yeah, they need sound bites. They need 30 seconds, a minute, and, or whatnot. But in order to convey the depth and the... Um, the amount of the, the, the perspective that's outside of the mainstream perspective to actually inform and educate people and give people a context on things, you need a lot more than three minutes. As a rule, all of the nightly news shows, all of those people, they, they will not give you that context and 
no matter how good their intentions are and no matter how much integrity that journalist has, uh, the constraints they're given won't allow for a good story to come out of it. A documentary, uh, either a one hour or a two hour, these uh, video formats, there's, uh, uh, there's a possibility that a good story will be done. You can actually tell a story in an hour, so there's a possibility of this. So there was a, uh, uh, two or three years ago, I was uh, approached by a reporter from uh, a and &E Investigative Reports. And they were doing a, a thing, they, they told me the thing they were doing on was cybercrime. I'm like, okay, cybercrime, great. And they wanted me, a, they wanted some new footage to talk about this uh, slew of attacks against uh, uh, Yahoo and, and uh, uh, eBay. And at the time there was just a whole rash of, of e-commerce attacks. I didn't know anything in particular, but honestly, m most of the time, in hacking stories, you don't need a specific knowledge. You just need like to read the news articles and and, and be informed on your own, and then your perspective as a, a security person will sound informed and be intelligent. And and anyone anyone could have done this interview. Anyone. Anyways. I had them send me uh, three tapes from previous shows that the, this, this particular company produced. Because I wanted to know, okay, you want to interview me? Well, and investigative reports that you could, you could bury me, you could hatchet me. So send me, some, send me some tapes. They sent me some tapes. I reviewed them. It didn't look all that bad. I, uh, I talked to the uh, reporter that was wanting to do the interview. That was great. She seemed like she had integrity. That was great, too. I said, okay, we'll bring you down. You can come down. So they flew out and they set up in my house and all that sort of stuff. When we did the interview and, and they, they, they had integrity. I, they very much had integrity. They could have hatcheted me. They could have... Uh, uh, if someone takes an hour's worth of video with you, you're giving them enough ammunition to destroy you if they want to. Uh, as a rule, no matter how careful you are, if you keep talking for a long enough amount of time, uh, that can be spliced together to make you look like an idiot or evil or anything they want you to. But she had integrity, and I believed in her. Unfortunately, <coughs> she was producing this for another company, not directly for Annie. So she got done with all this, cut it all up, sent it to Annie, and then what's his face that the host Annie has his little voiceover. And man, every I, I, I watched that story. Everything the voiceover said was arguably incorrect. Not a single true fact. The, the the production company that did the thing he was doing the overlay for, they actually did some research. They tried very hard. They they did a pretty good job. But that that, that guy that sounds distinguished and has that authoritative voice and um, the voiceover, the host of the show, everything he said, nonsense. Didn't bother me all that much. That's fine. What did bother me is the show was not about um, it's not about uh, cyber crime uh, or theft. The name of the show was E Terror. So I was thrilled about that, needless to say, and I would have been completely upset and uh, um, very, very angry. Except I got a contract that made me a lot of money over the whole thing, so it's all good. second please gathering my thoughts and turning on my notebook that has too long of a timeout for or too short of a timeout for its hibernate thank you Microsoft I like to thank Microsoft in, in all of my speeches I, I'm a tester so I make money off bugs so thank you Microsoft so when, when, when a media person approaches you, you need to look into their background and you need to do the due diligence. That's very important. Also, you need to understand what your agenda is. The media, when they come to you, they have an idea for a story. They know what they want to do already. As a rule, as a rule they already have a formulated story and they're finding you hoping you'll fit the piece that will help their story and reinforce the idea they already had going into it all. So to, to think that they want, and, and you know, obviously they're interested in what you have to say because they're, they're, they're talking to you, but they really, as a rule, when they talk to you, they already have what they imagine what the story's going to be and where it's going to go. 
So it's really important to understand what this is and to get it from them. You know, okay, what are you trying to say? You know, you want to find out what their agenda is. They have an agenda. They really do. And they'll be honest about it. You know, reporters, they have stories. They have deadlines. Um, then they, they want to get something out. That's great for them. But you need to figure out what their agenda is. Because if you don't know what their agenda is, walking into the story, if you don't know what they framed in their mind as what is the story before they walk in, you'll be shoved in the context of the point they're trying to make. Which may be good, and it may be very, very bad. Often in uh, the area of computer crime, what sells is controversy, um, is dramatic things. They, 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 they want a story that will really interest people and ignite people, and it can be dangerous in cybercrime. Okay, so, one, one short thing. This was the first bullet point uh, uh, I, I had. Yeah, I'm at my first bullet point, that's right. If you commit crimes actively, right now, if you're what they call active, if you're running around doing crazy, stupid, illegal things, right? probably very, very unwise to talk to the media. Chances are there'll be a point in your, time, in your life when you're like, you know what, I have a job, or I'll hack my own internal network, I'm not going to break any laws anymore. There'll be a time when you're not going to be running around committing felonies that could put you in jail for 200 years just for the thrill of discovery. Your own personal risk analysis at some point in your life will say, well, that's a bad idea. But if you're still running around doing crazy Ill illegal things, don't talk to the media. Do not talk to them. The FBI watches the news. The FBI watches the news. Even if there's a little handle underneath you, and you're like, yeah, when I was in the Citibank the other day, the FBI has some due diligence and they'll figure out who you are. So you need to have an agenda walking into the whole thing, because they have an agenda. And if you understand what their agenda is, and then you have your own personal agenda, um, say it's uh, anonymity rights, or um, um, you want to defend, uh, uh, you want to attack some legislation about the severity of penalties for this or that or the other thing. And there's a lot of good agendas to have, and there's a, a, a lot of reasons to talk to the press. <coughs> if you can figure out how to change your message to meet with what they need for their story, so you, you essentially match agendas. You meet, you, you meet middle, in the middle ground. So you, you give them what they need. And, and people that are experienced in talking with media have an understanding of, of, of what the media needs. But you make sure that it's what you need as well. Otherwise, you're being used by them. And you're, you're, you're not serving yourself at all. You're, you're doing volunteer work for, for Fox, for Rupert Murdoch. Oh yes, the glory of the slides. They're not up there right now because I don't like people watching other things. I like people watching me fumble around with my, uh, with my notebook. That's much more entertaining. So a, a brief note on the local media. I'll just touch on the local media for one second. And, and I, I, I I don't mean to hurt anyone's feelings, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there's local media. They're good people, probably, some of them, I'm, I'm sure. But as a rule, they will never do you any good. Never, ever, ever, ever. I, I, I actually, I, I, maybe that's not true. If you, if you want to talk about uh, local school board elections or local matters that, uh, in your political, in, that will make a difference in your region, um, it, that might be worthwhile. But don't talk, don't talk about larger issues to the local media, because they don't know. They don't know at all. I, I was in uh, Amsterdam um, a couple of years ago, and there was a terrorist attack. It was post 9-11. Some bomb somewhere went off or something, or an anthrax thing, maybe. Right? Lots of that stuff going on. And uh, I was walking down the street, and this uh, journalist, this local Amsterdam journalist, walked up to me and said, hey, are you an American? I'm like, oh, yes, 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 I'm an American. Like, we want your opinion, your, you know, your reaction to blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, really? Okay. C can you tell me that a little bit carefully and a little bit more closely, the blah, blah, blah? Because, like, that's all I know about it, right? What do I know about it? Who the heck am I? I'm a man on the street. I don't know. 
and I haven't read anything about it, I haven't researched anything about it, how can I gain an opinion that's, that, that by definition is an uneducated opinion? So tell me what the tell me about the terrorist stuff, and I'll give you my reactions to it. And he's like, ah, uh, yeah, we need a different American, right? That's not the right American for us. There, there, there's a few there's a few questions that and I think it's getting better, but uh, years and years ago there were the common questions that if you were interviewed as a hacker that you would always get. One of them is the definition of hacking, and I, oh, man, that's like. I wish that discussion would go away. I wish I, I wish the hackers could get the, the word back and that'd be that. But there, there, there's another one that, that is, what's your most impressive hack? And, and to me, I, I translate this to, what laws have you broken, the most dramatic and critical ones, that you can talk about on television? Yeah, thank, man, thanks guys, you're looking out for me. You get your interview, I get my jail time. That rocks. So there, 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 I, I have my answer to that, though. Uh, when the media asks me what's my most impressive hack, and I'm not sure many of them get this, uh, that not, no media I've ever related this story to ever says, wow, that's a great hack. They all kind of frown, and no one will ever print it. <laughs> this will not ever be printed as the greatest hack I, I had. So the, the local media came to uh, 2600 in Austin, and I was there. And there was a local crew, and the, they had like the things for the cameras, the lighting, all sorts of things, like three people. And they're like, yeah, we want to know about hackers and hacking. This is 2600, you're all a bunch of hackers. Great. Want a story from local news. Cool. So, I, I'm, I'm a skeptical person. Arguably, uh, as a test term, a professional pessimist. I'm like, you know, I, I like interviewing the media. I, I enjoy interviewing the media, getting information about them, getting their perspective. This is, this is interesting to me. So I asked her a number of questions. I asked the reporter a number of questions. I'm like, can you talk to me about Kevin Mitnick? All right, I figured 2600 meeting, minimal, utter minimal research is going to 2600.com and spending three and a half minutes there. So I'm like, what are the top issues at 2600.com off? Top of my head, you know, she should know something about some of these. Do you know, tell me about Kevin Mitnick. No. Do you know who Kevin Mitnick is? No. Do you know who Bernie S is? That was also a very large issue on the site. No. Do you know who? I went through a list of terms. I went, I, I tried to make it as basic as generic. I, I wasn't drilling down. It's not like I was doing an interview where I was trying to probe the depths of their knowledge. I was trying to find any knowledge. I was trying to try to find anything about any of the issues she might re be reporting about that would have a glint of recognition in her eye. Nothing. Eventually, she was getting very defensive. I didn't mean to put her on the defensive. I just, I just wanted to uh, uh, have an understanding of where she was coming in. And 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 sh she's like, you know, look, I'm just blah 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 blah. And I'm like, look. You don't do a story on the global economy without knowing what the New York Stock Exchange is. When you have a dumb look in your eyes, when someone mentions the New York Stock Exchange, doing a story on the global economy, that's not a good sign. Maybe you're not the most qualified person to give that story. So I decided that this reporter should not get a story. It would, the scrutiny on the local hacker scene would not be a good thing. I, I couldn't see any good coming out of it. What she wanted to do, what she wanted on the press, would not help us, would not help our cause, or the multiple of, uh, mul multiple of causes that people might have. It, it, it would be bad. So I went around to 30 people one by one, and I uh, showed them the list of little key phrases I came up with, and I'm like, there was a dead look, on all, blank look on all of these. She doesn't know any of this. So what we need to do is, uh, after I've talked to everyone about this, we all need to look at each other, stand up, and leave and kill the entire 2600 meeting after about 20 minutes. So we did this. And her stories walked out the door en masse. Everyone left. Everyone was gone. And I'm like, yeah, that's the, the hack I'm most proud of. And I can assure you, if I told a story about breaking into some banking system instead, that shit would get printed every day, all day long. Me would be like, wow, yes, you hacked into blah, 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 cool. 
But when I explained that I killed a reporter's story that was clueless and deserving of it, um, yeah, honestly, most ha most media um, wouldn't even understand why I would call that a hack. They wouldn't get it at all. There is um, there, there was one person that stayed behind. I convinced everyone to leave the room. Everyone left. Everyone went somewhere else to party. One person stayed behind. But he had a consulting uh, business he was just starting up, and he was trying to pimp it, which is good. He was sort of like Peter Shipley. He's like, ah, media, I have a point. I'm selling something. I can get on television. People will know who I am, and I can make money from it. And at the time, I was a little bit disappointed that he didn't run away like the rest of the people. Um, but, but in retrospect, I understood that was, that was very reasonable. So there's another, there, there's another uh, instance when, uh, which uh, I think it's inappropriate to talk to the media, even if they're a good media. Um, and, and I'll tell you, personally, if, if I had my druthers, I, I prefer to do background work. I prefer to, prefer to do background. Because, and here's the reason why we should talk to the media at all. You know, I'll, I'm, I'm kind of drumming all these negative things, but, you know, I don't want everyone walking away from here saying, I'm not going to talk to the media, they're going to screw me. The thing is, the problem is, there's already these perceptions about what a hacker is, um, how dangerous they are, what, what a threat to society they are. There's all of these perceptions that are generally negative out there. And if hackers never stand up and have a voice to counter that, there will be no opposition to the people that have those opinions, and our voice will be lost, and the global conversation that is the media will be dominated by people that want to demonize and criminalize us. So we really do need to be in the media to some degree and articulate clearly why we're not the bad guys and why we need to reclaim the word and why the laws are, are over harsh and, and uh, people shouldn't go to jail for writing uh, crypto code or hacking some hardware for, for fun and profit. Um, so, for example, let me, let me tell you when you should, when I think I would want uh, to, to refer a reporter to someone else. I, I'm comfortable talking to the media, but there, there's times when, uh, when I, I, I think um, the, the, the thing about background is, is, you're, is you're informing the person who's doing these stories and will do further stories. You're giving them a background of knowledge that they will use and, and in the future and a context because Honestly, if, if we could just inform all the media and educate them and get them on the right perspective, none of us would have to come on camera ever because they would then start doing good, good journalism. So background is the coolest thing, I think. Point them to resources and links where they can get informed about these issues and hear reasonable people articulate about them. And you know, point them to academics that have reasonable opinions. Um, let me give you an example. If I'm, occasionally I wear a black trench coat. If I'm wearing this black trench coat and all punked out and like looking like a freak, and a reporter comes to, up to me and says, hey, we want to talk about library filters and keeping child porn out of the hands of people that go to the library. I'll take a look at myself in the mirror and I'll be like, um, did you ask me to defend child pornography? What? No, 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 no. I'm against filters, but no, no, hold on. Furthermore, I look like a freak, which is fine sometimes. I like looking like a freak. That's a lot of fun. But what I think would be more appropriate, um, mainly, partially because I'm not the expert on these things, and I know who the experts are. I know the people that have made filter, library filtering their cause and can name congressional sites that uh, uh, the filters will, won't let you get to and uh, um, all this sort of thing. It's people that, that are, are really in-depth and know what they're talking about. I would refer them to someone else, and I would not let them uh, take the story from me. Um, and uh, another example, if, if uh, someone wanted to talk to me about e-voting, for example, um, I would not, you know, it, 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 at DEF CON, if they hadn't talked to Rebecca, Rebecca Mercury, who like did the presentation on it and knows all this stuff, I, I wouldn't want to talk to him, because wait a second, you're not looking to be informed on this. The information's right there. That's the expert source. You know, I'll give an opinion if you've already gotten the expert. You know, I'll be the man on the street for that one, right? 
and I haven't found a single security uh, expert or hacker that thinks uh, electronic voting is secure in any, any means. And, and let me know if you find one uh, afterwards. I'm, I'm interested in having a discussion with them. That, that should be lots of fun. But if you can point the media to the right place and not do the story yourself, you're still impacting the media in a good way. You're still uh, creating the, the, the story that you want created because talked a little bit about uh, uh, PR firms and the uh, influence of corporations on the media. PR firms write press releases and those press releases get turned into news stories and the vast majority of everyone on the globe is lazy. This also applies to journalists. So if they can get spoon fed some stories, they're all over it. And hence you'll see stories that were essentially handed to them. And even on television, you'll see stories on television where the video footage is pro provided by a multinational corporation who's pushing their agenda and they're creating news. And, and news is very much uh, event uh, oriented. There's no nothing that happens. For example, uh, I, I, I'll use the uh, electronic voting as an example. I think this is very interesting. The, the, the state of the security in the, the, the voting systems has been poor forever since anyone ever attempted to do anything. There has been some scrutiny, there has been some research uh, that, that, that's shown this, but this has been a known fact to anyone that's cared to investigate. And for some reason, apparently two days ago, um, all of the media around was publishing stories about what happened uh, at Black Hat and then at DEF CON regarding uh, Bev Harris and, and uh, uh, Rebecca Mercury's speech on, on electronic voting. This was an event for them. Nothing happened, right? There was an explosion somewhere that happened and suddenly voting was insecure. No, now there was an event that happened which was they, they gave a presentation and, uh, and suddenly the media is, wrote all these stories about something that was a constant condition. There's this constant condition of what was going on and, but it wasn't newsworthy until there's an event associated with it. So they're very much uh, uh, event driven. And we're at an event right now, obviously. Oh yeah, I, I have to mention this. This is the most mortifying uh, media experience that ever happened to me at, uh, at DEF CON. Um, it, I, I wanted to shoot myself like when the person introduced themselves. So I, I'm hanging around pool whatever and someone walks up to me and they say, Hi, I'm from a teen people. I'm like, oh, fuck. No, 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 no. How did you get here? How do you know about this? And they're like, yeah, we want to talk to you about what you're wearing. Can you talk about some fashion trends in the hacker community? So I, 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 I told them no. And then I asked them for a gun and a bullet so I could shoot myself. It's when teen people are showing, on at Def Con, showing up at DEF CON, I don't know. They shouldn't have gotten the memo. They should not have gotten that memo. They're like, it'll be fun. I'm, and you know, I couldn't criticize them too much. So like, to 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 expect uh, uh, to expect <laughs> to 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 expect knowledge, wisdom, and perspective from a reporter from Teen People, you know, then I'm an idiot, right? <laughs> so that that's another thing. In addition to looking at the reporter um, and looking at the stories they've done, uh, be it uh, newsprint or video, uh, also look at what they're doing the story for. What's the publication? So it's entirely possible that the reporter has been like a reasonable person that's been doing freelance work, that there's lots of great stuff they've been doing, but right now their assignment is from some really bad paper, some really, um, I. I yeah, I'm being videoed. I don't want to give any examples, Fox, offhand. Um, but if, if, if they're from a source that is, um, is clearly unreputable or has a context of printing things that are inflammatory or irresponsible, then while the person may be a responsible person and a good person, 
their editor is demanding things from them in order to get something published and printed, and so um, it, it probably won't be a good story. So also look at the publication and look at the context in which it will appear. Uh, yes. I love silence. Silence is so much fun. Oh, let me let me just give a couple practical tips for talking to video media, and and I really recommend I, video media will it, it'll hit more people, it will will reach more people, so that's an advantage. Um, but print media is, in my mind, the only thing that has a chance to educate people unless the format is uh, of considerable length. Three minutes, it's not going to work. Uh, but if you're going to talk to video media, and I've done it, as, as, and I continue to do it uh, for some reason, it's probably my ego. Um, let me give you some tips. First of all, the, the, whatever the reporter says, and they ask you a question, you're on tape, remember that that is not what is going to be on, on, on television. Their question will never appear. Anything you ever say, anything you ever say to the media has to stand alone. Every, I would say every sentence that you speak, expect it to be chopped out and there's just that one sentence. So try to think in complete thoughts and complete sentences, construct them, and this will help you being, uh, from being taken out of context. So, and, and if you want to fuck, if you want to fuck with the media, the the video or whatnot, you just want to play with them a little bit. Um, they shove a uh, camera in, in your face and do, ask you a question. Um, just answer yes, I think so, or no, not really. <laughs> and they can't use it, and then they'll they'll try to explain like, uh, no, you really need to explain it a little bit, but yes, I do. Uh, another thing is if, you know, and, and I misspeak myself consistently, continually, if you um, find yourself saying something you didn't mean to say on camera, now obviously we're not talking about uh, anything live, and God, I would never do anything live. If you find yourself saying like, oh wow, what am I saying here? Dun -dun 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 -dun. Stop yourself, mid-sentence. Make the entire clip unusable, and just say, oh, I'm sorry, and then just start a new sentence. Because they, they, they know how to splice and clip. So any anytime you, you're you uncomfortable with what you just said, or you don't think you stated it in the most effective and uh, appropriate way, stop yourself mid-sentence um, and explain, you know, say, let me restate, because that also won't be, won't be in the media, and then, and then try to, to do it again. They'll understand this. That's absolutely fine. Also, I, I highly recommend thinking. Uh, after, uh, after they s ask the question, don't answer them immediately. Tell me about blah, blah, blah. Do not open your mouth at that point. Do not do that. Because the instinct and the, you know, people are conversational uh, people and, and they, um, they want to just react without thinking. And words come out of people's mouths without thinking them through. That can be very bad for you. So you get the question, sit on it for a couple seconds, kind of construct, not, not all the words, but like construct a response in your mind, and then give it back out to them. And, and they won't mind this. Um, and if they do, it doesn't matter. You're just looking out for your own best interests. You don't want to be a uh, sound bit. That's always very bad. Yes, the glory of word. I, I would like to, to talk a little bit about um, the evolution of covering hackers in the media and how everything has changed, and I think for the better. Um, De DEF CON, uh, I believe, was the first, uh, and I could be wrong, um, that's fine, I'm often wrong, I believe it was the first uh, hackers conference to invite the media. And, and this wasn't, there were some mixed feelings about this. Um, you know, we also invited uh, a prosecutor and the media and lawyers. So we figured, well, feds are going to come anyways. So we might as well invite them, let everyone know up front. The feds are here. 
Uh, but then if the feds want to bust us for something unreasonable, we want press here to cover that, so a little checks and balances going on. And then if we really need one, we want a lawyer on hand, too. So we invited lawyers and then the uh, press and, and the feds. I, I think that's a good idea. I'm happy how that's worked out. Um, the, the coverage has changed a, a lot over the years. And I don't know how many of you, uh, when you started uh, getting interest in this stuff, uh, went through every frack that was ever published and read them cover to cover. Uh, I will tell you, there's a hand up there. Rock on, dude. Um, have you done that in the last three years? Because 10 years ago, that was doable. 10 years ago, you could like go through and you know, you'd have some reams of paper and stacks of paper, but you could actually get through and read all this stuff. Now, like a, a single frack issue is a friggin' book. Um, so reading it all now is a lot harder. I, I still think everyone should do it. But there, there's a section in there about news coverage. And I think it's really interesting to look at those old fracks and they reprint news stories and they show you what they, people were saying about hackers and the context they were portrayed in the media then. And it was abysmal. It was scary. There was no nuance. There was, it was all very, it was all, it was bad. It was about um, criminal activities and it was about um, impressive hacks and people going to jail and all. There's no one on the beat. The, the media that were writing these stories weren't informed on the topics they were writing about. And as time has gone by, there are high-tech crime reporter, uh, computer crime reporters that aren't clueless, that know what they're doing. And, and, and if, you, if you have a story, um, if you have some information that, that uh, is newsworthy and you want to give it to someone, make sure you, you find the best reporter to hand it to, the, the trustworthy one and people that have been uh, covering this beat for, for some time. Um, and I, I must give some props to uh, uh, Kevin Polson's uh, uh, journalism. I guess he has a bit of a perspective and knowledge on it that surpasses your average uh, journalist. So things are, are improving dramatically, and, and there, there's a lot more balanced and fair coverage now, so to speak. Um, and I think collectively, we are the only ones that can really improve the situation further. We are the only ones that have the power to change the public's perception of what it is to be passionate and curious and obsessive about technology that doesn't merely have criminal connotations. You know, it, it, I don't know if the word hacker, if we can reclaim that word to uh, just mean, you know, obsessively curious, anti-authoritarian, you know, not a bad person, really. Without hackers, we'd, we'd be in trouble. Oh, just a, a, a small um, a thing that amused me about what the media was re, uh, reporting without a one-sided report. A few years ago, virtually every company out there, there was a large company, wanted to make a very public statement about hackers and their hiring policies. And so there, there was story and story and story written about how com XYZ company does not hire hackers. This does not happen. It was unopposed. There was no opposing voice in the press. There was no one that, that there was no stories to counter this this thing. And therefore, the Globe, everyone that read any of this, anyone that saw any of these things, you're like, oh, well, Microsoft doesn't hire hackers. Uh, ISS doesn't hire hackers. Bindview does, you know, all you know. And I'm I'm not. Those weren't necessarily companies that said it. I was just picking random companies as as examples. The funny thing was though. At the time, all of my hacker friends were employed. You know, it was at the top of the dot-com boom. They were all had jobs. And I looked at these people, these companies were giving quotes about not hiring hackers, and all my friends were working at them. And so I, I don't know what that means. I, I, I don't know what they meant when they said that. Either they were lying or they, the PR person that uh, uh, decided to give that quote to the media didn't know the, the freak that was actually keeping their infrastructure intact. I'm not sure. I, I, I assume it was, it was very deliberate um, uh, misinformation and, and deception, but it was unopposed. There weren't people standing up and saying, yeah, I, I, I work for, you know. Well, that, that was the problem. You know, the people don't want to uh, jeopardize their job. But if someone would have stood up and said, uh, "Hey, all my friends are working at all these companies, and everyone's a liar," um, I think some, I, I think the perception of hackers would be changed at that point, and a small bit, right? You just kind of 
you have to keep uh, uh, whittling away at, at the people's perceptions and and uh, uh, constant influx of reinforcement of, of the message. So. People in, in corporations are, are uh, taught how to deal with the media. They're given little classes, little one-day classes. And I talked to someone recently that, that speaks to the media at a, a large corporation. They speak to them quite a lot. And uh, one of the things she, she says, and it makes complete sense, it's all it kind of uh, conventional wisdom, intuitive, is to stay on point. Right? Remember I was talking about their agenda and your agenda? If you just... They say, well, what about um, the dangers of child pornography at libraries? And you say, well, the problem with filtering is that all these things are, are, are blocked out and these First Amendment issues, and these freedom of speech issues, and essentially you're not addressing the question at all, right? They ask you the question and that response has nothing to do with their question but they still might use it, it still might be useful for them, they might be frustrated by this, but they, they still have something, they have some content, at the end of the day, um, they need to publish a story, so it might get in, so stay on point. Think of your agenda every time you open your mouth. What is the point I'm trying to make? And don't worry about not addressing their question. Don't, you know, they say X, don't even just say, think to yourself, I can say anything I want now. Um, and. You know, they appreciate it and they'll, they'll probably get frustrated if they don't get anything they can use. So you need to, if, if you want to propagate your message, you have to give it within the context of the story they're, they, they, they're uh, writing. So you have to give them something they're going to use. But um, always uh, uh, stay on message and on point. And you could see this in action. It's terribly frustrating with politicians, for example. You ever see politi politicians interviewed? And they're like, wow person asked a question, the answer had nothing to do with it. They're harping on, they're reading a script. Like they're ignoring the journalist. What's going on there? I don't know, you know, in the interview, it looks like the person's totally evasive and whatnot. Um, of course, that's an interview setting as opposed to many other uh, formats where the interviewer doesn't, you never see the interviewer, which is generally how uh, all of us would ever get in the media, you know, unless we're sitting down with Tom Brokaw or whatever. Um, so always, always stay on point. Um, I don't know. I, I have about uh, 20 minutes uh, material on how to be an intelligent news consumer, um, but uh, I'm in about five minutes of time, so I, I'll wrap it up and say, how you are perceived is up to you. We have impact on how hackers as a whole are per perceived. Being able to be given the opportunity to talk to the media gives you power, but it can also place you in danger. And don't get hacked by the media because it's not because they were bad people, it's because your defenses were down. And if you do it right, you and we can hack the media successfully. Thank you. <laughs>